it's a delicate dance being a snarky black person in a world of whiteness. A few years ago, as a tired graduate student, I wrote a blog post called, There Are No Good White People. <laughs> now in it, I wrote that the idea of being a good or safe white person is a dangerous story that white people tell themselves. One that ignores the fact that for black people in the United States, any white person could, at any moment, access the power of a white supremacist state to end the life of a black person. Now I was not, to be clear, accusing all white people of being bad, <laughs> but I was pointing out that whiteness bestows upon a person a credibility directly at the expense of a black people. Now at any point, a white person could call the police, could allege victimhood or attack, and have a higher likelihood of both being believed and having access to state resources like the police for assistance. Now, while I was earnestly trying to share the lived reality I felt as a black person, I didn't quite anticipate just how good-hearted white folks would respond. So, <laughs> you see, whiteness also confers upon itself an innocence, an erasure of the very processes of violence that allow white people to move without racial terror within the United States. Now this access to state violence, this ability to hurt then is erased in the minds of those who possess it. And to call that out, it has hefty consequences. The nasty emails came in trickles over time. The angriest were directed to the administration at a university in rural Virginia where I had my first professor gig. Yeah. Now, these emails demanded that I be fired for my vile racism against all white people. <laughs> now, of course, by trying to get me fired, to translate their discomfort into my dismissal, these anonymous reviewers were once again proving my very point for me. Now, I had punctured the balloon of innocence, of goodness, and for that, <laughs> I deserved every manager a Karen could find to make me be quiet. Now, after repeated email harassment, I just took the blog post down. I was so very tired of trying to fight it. And it wasn't my job to educate everyone, just the people I taught in my history classes every day. But in 2020, I read the coverage of Amy Cooper and her interactions with Blackbird watcher Christian Cooper. So, y'all remember. Now, after a tense encounter over her unleashed dog, Amy made false accusations to the police that Christian was threatening her, which he recorded in a video that went viral. And I couldn't help but return in my mind to that blog post. What was fascinating, utterly, was that Amy Cooper genuinely believed herself to be innocent, to be good, to not be a bad one. As did the hundreds of white people I saw denouncing her and her vile actions. Now, the very act of disavowing Amy Cooper served two purposes. It allowed people to rightfully condemn racist violence, bad, but it also allowed white people to imagine themselves, once again, as innocent, as not those kinds of people. Yet from experience, black people know that all white people, at any time, have the potential to hurt them, to access histories of racial power and violence against us. Now this does not mean that all white people are equally positioned in society. White folk can be marginalized in so many other ways but they do get the particular benefit of the doubt in their whiteness. And they do not have the added factor of being black in a society that is routinely set up to punish, hurt, and minimize us. As Amy Cooper felt angry or humiliated, she then could turn to a tool she inherently knew would protect her and would punish the black man in front of her. It was a tool that so many white people have access to whether they want to admit it or not. It is a fundamental power relationship that white folk are really invested in ignoring. And nor does this mean, and I am weary of stating this, that white people are some sort of vaudevillian villains twirling mustaches on the hunt for black blood. <laughs> no. One of the more exhausting conversations black people have with white people routinely involves white people's intent in a racist society. 
I am violently uninterested in whether or not Amy Cooper imagined herself to be a racista when she committed an undeniably racist and cruel act. White folks specifically want to be reassured that they are the good ones, that they cannot do bad. And if they did, they are irredeemable like Cooper. But as Jay Smooth once said, I'm uninterested if a pickpocket imagines himself to be a thief. I just want my wallet back. <laughs> so what does it mean to benefit from violence? Violence that you didn't do, but violence that you could still trigger at any moment. It's fucking hard to look at this, at that weirdness, at that discomfort. Very few people want to be the villain in their own stories. And that's where goodness comes in, like a shield. It's a natural impulse, this desire to be good. But it also denies the reality of existing in a shitty, broken, exhausting world. Focusing on being good is a way of escaping from those feelings, from those histories, and instead also trying to imagine that there aren't tensions or complications in your everyday relationships with black folks. So to think about this, let's go back to my time in Virginia. So I'm originally from Southern California, but I spent four years living and working as a professor of African history at Washington and Lee University in Lexington, Virginia. <laughs> So for those of you who are unfamiliar, Washington and Lee is named after two ever so sassy Southern slave owners, George Washington and Robert E. Lee. Yes, that one, who both contributed to the growth of the school. It's a picturesque white columned series of buildings nestled in the hills of the Blue Ridge Mountains, built by and supported with slave labor and home to a generally white and wealthy student body. It was a lot, y'all. <laughs> like Confederate reenactors invading the town once a year a lot, y'all. Like having the police call and offer me protection after being doxxed for planning the first annual Martin Luther King Day parade, y'all. Like being one of four black faculty at the university where I was teaching African history 200 feet from the grave of Robert E. fucking Lee and trying not to have a panic attack lot, y'all. I called it Confederate Hogwarts. <laughs> You're a grand wizard, Harry. When I arrived, on campus a few months after my 30th birthday. I wouldn't say that I was naive about what I had just moved to, but I do think that I was hopeful. I thought that I could come in and challenge the heavy, exhausting realities of the place by purposefully, joyfully taking up space. So how do you dress when you are a queer, black, brand new professor at Gone with the Wind University? <laughs> I knew I wasn't ever gonna fit in. Right, I mean, no pair of salmon pants, no blue blazer was gonna make me look like I belonged. So I responded by going, full steampunk! <laughs> Seriously, I kept a whole fashion blog about it called Clockwork Black. I had handlebar mustaches, bow ties, waistcoats, pocket watches, Big afros. I had a student tell me that I looked like a backup dancer in an antebellum Janelle Monet video. <laughs> and she was right. <laughs> and I loved trying to carve out a space like that. But nothing really prepares you for the daily lived reality of existing in a black body, in a space that was explicitly not designed for you. In a space tiled brick by brick with the brutal realities of enslavement, the realities of Confederate flags, and threats to my safety all the time. And this is where the nature of good white people became really clear. There were plenty of white professors in Lexington who abhorred the casual racism, who felt it was awkward and terrible. But they had also, in some ways, 
made peace with the place. It was a relatively decent place to raise a family of a certain hue. The pay was good, and the landscape was indeed very pretty, especially if you're one of those people that like hiking. Um, there was also the weird, jarring reality of polite white society in Lexington. There were plenty of people who wanted to help, who saw racism as bad, but who also didn't like being uncomfortable and didn't like us being loud. And that, that fucking hurts. When we first organized that Martin Luther King Day parade, which was not so coincidentally the weekend that the Confederate reenactors came to town every year and terrorized folk by menacingly waving flags on street corners and staring extra hard at the few brown folk around. <laughs> we had a considerable number of local white Lexingtonians that were instead concerned that we were causing the problem. I don't support racism in any way, TJ. They would tell me over coffee or in quickly written, often uncapitalized emails. <laughs> but aren't you doing too much? Like, this is confrontational and maybe we could just not rile up the Confederates. One woman, a local member of the Chamber of Commerce, insisted that there should be a neutral third group, not one supporting the Confederates, or Martin Luther King. <laughs> but that instead supported free speech for all. Now this, she said, is what good neighborliness would be like and being a good community member, something Martin Luther King Jr. would have wanted. <laughs> so, this is the exhausting problem of goodness. It's a weirdly flexible concept. It's a Teflon shield of self-projection that keeps you inured from the actual realities that other people are undergoing, the actual other risks that they're experiencing because you're so damn focused on you and on maintaining some sort of good person credit rating. And when I hear that, it stings. I feel the bile rise in the back of my throat. I see the performance the mask that doesn't see me as real. I'm simply a background image as someone chooses their comfort over my safety yet again. I think here in Southern California, somewhere like Lexington seems blindingly obvious, right? This sense of, well, okay, that's racist. <laughs> it's a space where the violence of the history weighs heavy and exhausting. But let's not get it twisted. Good white folks exist here in abundance. Indeed, by thinking racism only exists in places like Lexington, it's real easy to gaslight folk and say, well, there aren't real problems here. When police killings happen in places like San Diego with astonishing racial impunity, and now that I'm back from my time in Virginia, white folk often give me a knowing nod and say, you must feel so much safer here. I mean, sure, less Confederate flags are always great from a blood pressure, but Virginia doesn't have a lock on being built one brick at a time by histories of racist violence or exclusion. There are plenty of places that people can enjoy attending that might still be largely built on and lived through exclusion. It might be hard to feel like a cool hipster bar in an expensive San Diego neighborhood is a space for you to breathe or survive if someone could have their own Amy Cooper moment at any time. So the real problem with good white folks, y'all, is that goodness is performative. It's wanting to occupy a specific space, to earn credit, and to earn kudos. It's turning the world around you into a musical and expecting the actual people with skin in the game to be your background dancers. It's like being Sandra Bullock in The Blind Side. <laughs> you know, the movie about an actual black athlete's life that becomes about the nice white lady who helped him. And it's not about understanding why folk aren't as eager to praise your goodness because they're the ones that are actually suffering. In this way, people like Amy Cooper are not unlike asymptomatic carriers of the coronavirus. <laughs> they live their lives thinking they're fine and healthy, functioning in this society. And yet without warning, their body could bring harm to someone like me. A fact that absolutely surprises them and yet when I point this out to folks, I sometimes encounter an almost belligerent innocence. And I am fine, and I am safe, and I am good, and how dare you suggest otherwise? 
that covers a genuine fear that if they were not safe, that if they were not healthy, that something would be gravely wrong. But something is gravely wrong, y'all. Violent histories stretch behind us like those ivory columns did at Washington and Lee, casting long shadows into our lives. And these silent histories carry the potential to turn an everyday interaction into a lethal one for black folk. Goodness hides the reality of these histories from all of us. Goodness demands a spotlight to take the focus from other people's lived risks and experiences. Goodness is a dodge and a distraction, a sense of security that doesn't think who might be more at risk. So to return to my spicy blog post of a few years ago, maybe there can't actually be good white people, just people who do the work without affirmation, who don't prioritize their feeling safe and right and proper over the risks that other people feel every damn day.